Now, the US administration this week announced what it described as the biggest sanctions in its history, targeting a Syrian government agency. The sanctions follow a US cruise missile attack on Syria in retaliation, Washington claimed, for an alleged gas attack by the Assad government on civilians at the start of the month. But why does the US government remain reluctant to publish the evidence that Syria gassed its own population? Mark Hurst has this. The US government has followed up its military strike against Syria earlier this month by announcing this week what it described as sweeping sanctions against a Syrian government agency. 271 members of the Syrian Scientific Studies and Research Centre have been named by the US Treasury in what the administration described as one of its largest sanctions in history. Officials in Washington blame the agency for producing chemicals used in a deadly attack on Syrian civilians at the start of the month. But once again, the U.S. have failed to produce actual substantive evidence that the Syrian government were behind the attack. Shortly after Donald Trump was elected as U.S. president, he indicated he was ready to reset American policy with regard to Syria. But the gas attack on Khan Shikun appears to have changed all that. Well, earlier I spoke to Lionel, the award-winning media and political commentator, to get his take on current U.S. policy on Syria. Uh, Lionel, we've had these uh, fresh sanctions now imposed by the U.S. government. Where is U.S. policy at the moment with regards to Syria? It seems to be all over the place. No, I think you're being kind. It's incoherent. And not only is it incoherent, it is met uh, with a country, my fellow brethren, comrades, compatriots, who accept whole cloth without any critical thinking, any question whatsoever, this narrative that Assad gassed his people. And notwithstanding recurrent repetitive and most contradictory evidence, especially in view of history, 2013 in Ghouta, Americans don't question, don't at all show any suspicion. And I think it's primarily, sad to say, motivated by incuriosity more than anything else. And two years ago, former CIA officer Robert Baer said that, quotes, Russia had saved the U.S. from a foreign policy catastrophe in Syria by vetoing a U.S. resolution that could have seen a large military intervention by the United States into the Syrian conflict. Is there a risk that President Trump may still lead the U.S. to catastrophe in Syria? Well, I don't know about a catastrophe, but I'll tell you this much. There are many uh, folks who voted for Trump, and for the record, not that it matters, Matters, but as of out of a full disclosure, I voted for me. So I'm in a unique position. I never voted for any of these people. I don't I, I reject whole cloth, the whole notion of the left right paradigm. So I'm I'm not pro Trump or anti Trump or any of those lines or any of those uh, 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 factions. But there, there are many, many people, and this is critical for you to know, who are saying, What are you talking about Syria for? What do you even what does Syria have to do with anything? We never heard about Syria, especially somebody, and keep in mind this, you know, a lot of people have suggested that he he shouldn't be tweeting. They keep saying, you know, Trump's tweeting. He shouldn't be tweeting. That's not a presidential. Well, he might agree because when looking at the the cash of, of his tweets, he showed clearly a disinclination to follow into this warlike rhetoric when it came to Syria, which a lot of people applauded. And now he appears to have done a 180 on that. So we're asking ourselves, what are you doing and what threat does Syria in any way pose to the U.S.? If I might add something else, if you don't mind. You know, we have been hearing about ISIS, and I can't speak just for the United States, but we love a good boogeyman. Al-Qaeda worked for years. Al-Qaeda, AQI, then IS, and ISIL, and ISIS, and and then Boko Haram, and Al-Nusra Front, and Daesh, and you can't even keep track of these. Well, ISIS was the boogeyman. And of course, nobody looked and said, well, who is ISIS? Who funds ISIS? It doesn't matter. They're the boogeyman. They're bad. Well, it just so happens that this air base in Shariat, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it correctly, but this is where Assad launched, according to to Syrian officials, this is where he launched military efforts and planes and jets, rather, to attack ISIS outposts and to protect Christian cities. So we apparently decided to tomahawk blast an airbase, incidentally, leaving the runway intact, which is most interesting. But we decided to go after an airbase that was used as a launching pad to attack ISIS. And as we say here in New York, what the hell's going on? How long can the U.S. keep up this pretense of claiming Syria was behind these chemical attacks without providing some hard, substantive Ah, evidence? Forever! 
However, <laughs> I hope to sound like the disappointed parent because I look sometimes at many of my countrymen, by the way, being led by news individuals who are equally as bad, but they don't seem to care about reality. This is a, a landscape that only reads bumper stickers, headlines, cookie cutter, echo chamber, you know, little snippets and phrases, and then moves on. There's no depth. There's no suspicion. There's no question. There's no whatever is presented. That will do. And it's most disconcerting and most disappointing. And who is currently advising President Trump when it comes to U.S. policy in Syria? And do they understand that much of the issues that we've seen in that country have resulted from indirect proxy arming of jihadi groups, some of them or many of them aligned to al-Qaeda? <laughs> well, you're asking who is responsible for this? Well, I try to explain to people that we have here, yet again, what appears to be a, a wonderful cabal, a coven, a, a convocation, a melange of, of Wall Street, globalist warmongers, deep state and shadow government and, and the usual suspects. I mean, we all understand, I think, that war is money, big money. And the military industrial complex, not to mention financial global elitists and the like, look to Syria primarily as the site of a very, and we, we all know this, the pipeline hypotheses as to why Syria is important, why it's critical, why it's, why Syria, I ask people, why? What does Syria have to do with anything? And what people will say is, He's an evil man. He's a despotic leader. He's a, what? Why do you know this? I don't know. I just say this. I'm told to say this, and I repeat like, ar, 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 like a barking seal. That's what I do. You tell me the bad guy, and I'll give it back chapter and verse. This rote recitation of propaganda. Just like North Korea, rogue state. When you give people, and I don't want to go off into North Korea, but, but, but believe me, there is no critical thinking and no analysis as to who these people are or what their particular histories are as well. Lionel, a pleasure and a delight to speak to you today on World in Focus. Isn't it great? Anytime, my friend. Well, joining me now on the line to discuss this further is Jim Jatris, a former U.S. diplomat and Republican Senate foreign policy advisor. Jim Jatris, these new sanctions imposed by the U.S. administration follow on from its unilateral decision to attack Syria in the wake of this gas attack on Syrian refugees earlier this month. But the U.S. government is still no closer or to publicly presenting actual evidence to show the Syrian government was behind this. Why do you think the US government is so reluctant to publish that evidence or the evidence that it thinks it has showing the Syrians were behind the chemical attack? I have to assume it's because there is no such evidence that uh, not only have we not presented any evidence, but that there seems to be a resistance to any kind of a truly neutral investigation of the site, which of course is hampered by the fact that the site of the of the attack, and I think there's general consensus that there was an attack, but the question is by whom, uh, is controlled by Al-Qaeda and its allies, and uh, they're not going to readily give any kind of access to the site for a real investigation. Uh, I, I think it's clear from the, the speed with which the Trump administration launched its attack on the Shirat Air Base that did, didn't really care one way or the other uh, about uh, the, the accuracy of the accusation that the Syrian government was responsible, that they were trying to make some kind of a political point, uh, which they're continuing to do now by imposing the sanctions on this uh, the Syrian agency and, what is it, something like 271 individuals associated with it. And where do you think U.S. policy is headed with regard to Syria? And are they being manipulated? or is there any evidence to show they're being manipulated by Syrian opposition forces on the ground, most of whom are on their last legs? I'm not sure it's a question of being manipulated by them, except in the sense that if, uh, as many believe, including me, that this was a false flag attack by some of the opposition elements, whether Al-Qaeda or one of the groups associated with them, like Arar al-Sham or Jaish al-Islam or the other jihadist groups that we have been supporting, uh, you know, that that is an element of manipulation, but I, I think to say we're being manipulated is putting the card before the horse. Mm -hmm. The fact of the matter is that the United States government under the Obama administration and now unfortunately continuing under Trump 
have been supporting people in Syria we know are terrorists. It's as simple as that. Uh, that the, the, uh, There is no secular, moderate, democratic, tolerant opposition in Syria, that they're all some stripe of Salafist ideology. They're uh, in, in intolerant sectarian agenda uh, that w- means essentially curtains for the, for the Alawites, for the Christians, for uh, any secular Sunnis, for Shia. Uh, it's, it's a really bad crowd that we've been supporting. Uh, in, in conjunction with our friends in the Gulf states, particularly Saudi Arabia and also Turkey. And that has been our agenda, that they are, in effect, uh, agents of our policies, not that, that we're being manipulated by them. And what proof is there that these kinds of sanctions actually ever deliver any substantive change of policy from the country that they're targeted against? Well, they, they don't, of course. And I think the classic is uh, the question put to Madeleine Albright some years ago about sanctions against Iraq when Saddam Hussein was in power, that the reports that they did led to the deaths of half a million Iraqi children. And when asked if it was worth it, she said, yes, it is. And she tried to walk that back later. But I think she was more candid in her initial response. Sure, sanctions end up having a devastating effect on a lot of people, ordinary people, and generally the most vulnerable parts of society. But they generally don't have any impact on the policies of the government. If anything, they cause people to rally around the flag, so to speak, and uh, and reinforces the government's authority and their determination to, to hold to their policy. These latest sanctions, by the way, with regard to Syria and, and the supposed use of chemical weapons, targeting these scientists, I, I don't think, frankly, they will make that much difference in any respect. And if I'm looking for a silver lining here, I would say that these sanctions, despite all the bluster from, from Washington, are rather like that attack on the Shirat Air Base that they were designed to be as narrow as possible and not really have much of an impact on anything. And maybe that indicates something else going on behind the scenes. I hope that is the case, but um, I have no indication of it. And what danger is there that this focus on sanctions and the kind of rhetoric against the Syrian regime actually lead to policymakers taking their eye off the ball when it comes to the real threat in the region, which is that from Daesh? That, that is a huge danger. What, what all, The big picture the big problem I see is that rather than as we thought might occur based on what Mr. Trump said during the campaign is that we would work out a uh, a working relationship with the Russians to target, let's remember, not only Daesh, but the other jihadist forces in Syria, as I say, Al-Qaeda and uh, Ar al-Sham and these other groups associated with them. And instead, it seems we're falling back into this notion that only Daesh is a problem. But these other guys, including Al-Qaeda, well, they're not so bad. They're sort of the good moderate terrorists, not not the the bad terrorists. And we do have people calling for exactly that. Recently, Thomas Friedman of the New York Times, supposedly some kind of foreign policy genius, said, well, we know we should really lay off pressing ISIS because they can be very useful to us. Uh, This idea that the real problem in Syria is the Assad government the Iranians, the Russians, we have to play big geopolitical games, stop this Shiite crescent from forming, and that means we have to both make use of as well as be wary of these jihadist forces. I, that's, what's, that's what's been going on for, for over six years now, mm-hmm. and has created such carnage in Syria, and has led to the rise of all these terrorist forces. And finally, the, the Syria remains a close ally of Russia. The, the, this move may sour relations between Russia and the U.S. even further than it already is. Is is the reset of ties between Moscow and Washington that had been a prominent feature of Donald Trump's presidential race, is, is that now dead in the water? If it's not dead, it's it's on life support. And that unfortunately relates to more to American uh, domestic politics, that uh, ever since Trump won, in fact, even before he took office, there's been this full-throated scare. Some people have called it the new McCarthyism. Frankly, I think that's unfair to Joe McCarthy. Back in his day, there really were Stalinist agents in the United States, but here we have this paranoia witch hunt about any kind of connection or even a reasonable attitude toward the Russians where our, our interests coincide with those of Moscow. And uh, and I think for whatever reason, he's taken fear of the attacks that have been launched against him. And unfortunately, I would say, uh, staffed his administration with a lot of people who frankly follow the establishment position. Russia is still the main enemy. Iran is an enemy. Presumptively, China will be an enemy. And that somehow working with our terrorist friends in the Saudis is still part of the working code 
of American policy as it has been for the last 30 or 40 years. And I, I, I don't see how that's going to turn around. You know, maybe when Mr. Tillerson went to Moscow, there were some conversations in private that were a little different from what we heard publicly. But all the indications are that the administration, instead of draining the swamp, has become one of the swamp creatures, at least on foreign policy as it regards Russia. And I think that's extremely dangerous. Jim Jantris, a pleasure to speak to you today on World in Focus. Thank you.